have the comments open on my time I'm on StreamYard. I've I've never been on StreamYard before. Oh really? There you go. So I've got the I've got the comments open on LinkedIn as well. So for for anyone who's joining in, and we've just hit go live now. So I've just got to wait for it to come up on my LinkedIn. But um, guys, thanks for thanks for joining us today. I didn't talk about this before because it's kind of covered by my microphone. But I am supporting the live events or the live uh, facility industry. I'm trying to figure out which way to put this. I, I picked up this shirt by Gigi Easy, which is an esports bar here in Melbourne. Who's obviously been forced to do a closure, and and thankfully. Uh, there's a local, um, <laughs> there's a local, local t-shirt and printing company called uh, called Cool Shirts, and they yeah. uh, they do their collab together. I, w- I was at the launch weekend for a CDL in Minneapolis, and this is my commemorative t-shirt for that. This is oh, from your go. your Call of Duty event, Wim. At oh yeah, Call of Duty World Final. Thanks, Ben. No Thank problem. You Thank you very much. It's one of the softest That's shirts fantastic. I have. Thanks for f- floating the floating the colors. I appreciate it. I'm just trying to find this uh, this post to come up. My LinkedIn's bugging out a little bit on my mobile right now. So hopefully it won't take too long. And then we can read out some of the things. But guys, thanks for thanks for coming along today. And for anyone who's tuning in now to the Twitch, the VOD that we'll upload later, or to the, the LinkedIn Live, um, really what I said in my post and what I said to you guys beforehand and in emails is that everybody's talking about um, the problems right now everybody's talking about you know businesses that might be going under or people losing their jobs or or um, government initiatives say like in Australia we've got job keeper which is helping to keep people employed um, or job seeker for those who've lost their jobs but part of what I wanted to talk with is two people who are quite influential in the overall business space to learn some solutions and also your own plans and what you're going through right now so I guess on my screen, we'll go from from left to right. Ben, could you just give a bit of introduction to yourself, your company, um, and, and maybe a little bit of an intro as to how you've been affected? And then we'll go to Wim, and then we've got a few topics to talk about. Yeah, sure. So um, our company, Mook Esports, uh, we run venues, tournaments, and leagues. Uh, we have the largest esports venue in Canada, up in Toronto, and a second location in Windsor. Windsor is uh, the border town with Detroit. Um, so for us, definitely, you know, venues and live tournaments got hit the hardest. So, you know, the fact that we can't open, um, is devastating. Um, so there's some like kind of low hanging fruit that we did, you know, we rolled out a rental program. So if you can't come into our place to game, we sanitize a whole unit stream station, deliver it to you. So you can keep gaming at home. If that's the case, uh, a little bit of merch, um, a little bit of online tournaments, but at the same time, I think for us, there's two strategies. One, for everybody, you have to get lean. The esports industry was way too fat. There was so much excess, so much largesse with so many companies. And it's an important. this is an important time to, to get leaner. And I think to really focus on your balance sheet and what's important. So we've done that. It's We had to make tough decisions, but we did it nonetheless. Um, and the second thing is, you know, people always throw, you got to pivot. And, you know, for us, you know, when we do a LAN event in Toronto, like, we're the go-to place, you know, that's where people are going to come and game. But for us to run an online tournament, uh, if we did a free roll, a free, free to enter Fortnite tournament, we're competing with like thousands of organizations around the world and the economics of many online tournaments don't make any sense. So it didn't mm-hmm. make sense for us to pivot to online just for the sake of pivoting. Um, we're using a great program called GG Leap to engage our community. Um, but really it's, it's focusing on, bigger plans once we open and, you know, kind of just getting leaner, getting smarter. And that's our strategy forward. Yeah. How about you, Wim? Well, we, we are, uh, you know, a little bit different, maybe, maybe a lot different in, um, in that we, we are, I won't say we're balanced between online and live events. Live events um, are sort of the, the culmination and the, the coup de gras of, of our events, but most of what we do uh, is online. If you look at the, the um, life cycle of a campaign uh, uh, between World Gaming, our tournaments platform on the World Gaming side and on the collegiate side on CSL, we have a league uh, uh, platform all online. Uh, so so the, this notion of, uh, it, in fact, I was just talking before we got on this call, I, I am on calls, the last five weeks I've been on call from seven in the morning till 10 at night. And everybody is looking for replacement programming. I. I, I can't tell you the, the number of calls I've gotten from traditional sports teams, esports teams, traditional sports leagues, esports leagues, saying, how can you help us 
with your online tool set to create fan events, to create activations. To these are from from pro esports teams uh, to uh, the the Minnesota Twins. I mean, this is it's really an amazing thing that's going on right now. Um, and for us, who we have we've always our hallmark and our signature has always been our online events. So we do the the live events are very important. There's no question about that. Getting getting energy in a in a, a venue, getting fans to show up, uh, the players like it, the, the the brands and the sponsors like it. Um, but ultimately, um, our our tool set and and the value that we bring is is online. And so for us, this has been. Um, an amazing uh, time, and uh, you know, you, I, I, I think if you step back just a bit and and sort of put aside, you can't really put aside the the horrific uh, things that are happening on a pandemic uh, because of the pandemic. But if you step back and look what this is doing for esports, the intersection of traditional sports and 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 the, the, the intersection of, of mainstream. Um, and the new mainstream are now front and center. It, it, if this hadn't happened, we and we've been doing esports for for a number of years now. Um, the brand understanding, uh, media understanding of what esports is, is now all coming together. The, this, there's a big moment, big cultural iconic moment going on right now, where esports is now rising up into the mainstream, and the intersection of it. And traditional sports is front and center for for all of us. It's a it's a great thing in that regard. Not to not to um, uh, celebrate the, the the tragedy that's happening on, around the world, but but for us, I mean, I, I here's a good a good example. If I had ever had a, a phone call with the president of Fox Sports, I would have said, "You're you're nuts." I've had I've had calls with the president of Fox Sports, the president of NBC Sports. Uh, Sky TV, all coming, saying we don't have, we don't have programming, we don't have sports events, we don't have broadcasts. What, mm -hmm. what can you do to help us? And, and this notion of the the phrase being used is replacement programming. So, um, so for us, this has been, and and for anything in the online space, not just us. We're 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 as, as Ben said, there's a lot of online tournament platforms that are in the marketplace, but we have had um, ten years of ten plus years of doing this, and. We know uh, how to navigate the space. I think in a in a pretty good way. Um, it's an amazing time. And and yes, our we had to cancel our live our collegiate finals. Our grand finals is the final four of collegiate uh, esports in, in the United States. We had to cancel the the live event, but but uh, we're now pivoting to an all online uh, final. And and uh, thankfully we've got the tool sets and the and the, um, the infrastructure to support those kind of things. Yeah, I think you you explained it much better. I went on a traditional media outlet and tried to explain pretty much what you just said about Facebook now having the opportunity, and I made a meal of it, and they made fun of me. <laughs> so maybe it should have been you on that instead. But yeah, oh, no. well, we you know the the funny thing thing, and you see these examples. I, I know I love the story. You 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 saw the news about the NASCAR driver Bubba Wallace. He mm. uh, he's competing in a virtual NASCAR event. Um, he rage quits. He disparages a couple of his uh, competitors, and within two hours, his traditional sponsors from NASCAR drop him. I mean, that, if that mm. isn't the 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 primary a, a prime example of the intersection of traditional uh, mainstream and the new mainstream coming together, there was another well, somebody from the Chip Ganassi uh, team. He didn't. He not only got got dropped by sponsors, he got dropped by the team for. But he made a he made a racist remark. Uh, same kind of thing. He he was a mm. He's a real driver, but he was he was on a I think it was I think it was the i racing uh, game, and uh, so this it, this is front and center for for all of us. It it won't stay around forever, but but my what I my opinion and my contention is that the the genie's out of the bottle. Um, now, now there's understanding. Now there's clarity. People now see what esports is and how it compares to traditional sports, and that and that's a good thing for. For everybody in this space, it's a it's a it's a great opportunity for us to to now understand and have the general population understand what it is we do. Yeah, I feel like it's a it's a great opportunity for esports to show what it can do. And you know, most of the sim racing guys that I've talked to, and I agree with them, is they say that it's you know esports is never going to be a replacement for traditional sports. But I think it wasn't taken seriously in the past. There are ways that esports and gaming can simply be a fan engagement exercise to solve, say, your problems. 
And some of the talks that we've had, say, with the head of partnerships at the UFC with Nick Smith, you know, they have no problem filling out a stadium around the world, but they have the quote unquote problem of they've got unlimited pay per views they can sell. So are they accessing the gaming audience through influencers, through esports teams? Do they have PewDiePie yeah. sitting ringside next to The Rock and people? And, you know, even Donald Trump goes to the MMA. Do they right. have that? You know, if you're thinking about, say, cricket, which is one of the most popular sports in Australia, live attendance is very poor. So are there ways that you can use gaming to bolster that live attendance? Other sports, say the NBL, which is basketball here in Australia, yeah. um, was in its death knell a few a few years ago, five, ten years ago, and now it's thriving. But they're at a space now where they're looking for alternative revenue streams. So can gaming function as that? And I think it's it's great to see people thinking differently other than I need to buy a team. I need to make a whole league. I need to make a whole event. Sometimes it could be like that stay-at-home GP they did for the MotoGP. They they yeah. shipped out, like, what was it, like 12 PlayStations and webcams and microphones to, to real-life um, motorbike races and just did a, a fun engagement stream with them. And that's that's exactly what we're planning with, uh, you know, or along those same lines with baseball here in Victoria as well and wider baseball Australia. You know, it's a very participatory, participatory sport here. It's not, a, it's not like the MLB is. It's not necessarily a professional circuit, but they've got thousands of kids now who don't have Thursday night training and Sunday night gameplay to look forward to anymore and they're yeah. just stuck at home and they're just wandering around the house annoying their parents and a lot of the call is as much from the kids as it is from the parents to say we, we want some normalcy back in their lives we want them to play twice a week online and, and have some sort of interaction with that community yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm happy you brought up nascar because i think that's that's the best example of you know traditional sports being able to excel in esports right? The, the skill set is so similar. So your favorite yeah. drivers are going to excel in the esports version of that. It doesn't happen in any other in any other sport like that. I mean, yes, there's a handful of uh, NBA players who can play 2K at a medium level, really at best. Um, and it's cool to watch them. But when you see someone who's literally like a professional NASCAR or Indy race car driver and then excel in sim racing like that, uh, it's amazing, and vice versa. The pros when they get into the cars. So NASCAR, for sure, I think in terms of traditional sports, they're going to be the leader and the winner in this. Uh, and I think the other leagues have to get a little bit more creative in how they're going to create those crossover opportunities and branding of getting their traditional sports athletes to compete in the in the complementary esports. Yeah, that's that's definitely a good point. I find it awkward sometimes trying to explain to the professional sports athletes that maybe they're not as good at Call of Duty as they think they are, because <laughs> you get that sometimes. <laughs> And it's funny that then most of them don't play the sports that they're in, right? Like most uh, NHL players are better at Fortnite than they are at NHL 20, you know? Yeah, mm. right. that's so, so right. So one of the first questions I wanted to, to ask both of you guys is, is did you have any protection policies in place um, for, you know, major disruption to happen? Is, is, that even, is that even possible or feasible in a business? Uh, you know, I, I can answer for, for World Gaming and CSL. I, I guess our protection was... We we did ha we do have um, online uh, as our as our hallmark as our, as our sort of the the signature of what it is we do and and you know in in light of all of all of what's going on so I guess somewhat of an insurance policy that that we can continue to operate and run our events um, and and culminate you know as it's not as exciting potentially to to uh, have a on all online championship event, but, but, you know, with the uh, produced uh, stream in a, in a studio and, and teams working out of their respective homes, you could make it look like, like it is a, a, a big championship event. So, so I think not, mm. certainly not wittingly or, or not um, something we were thinking about from a protection perspective. It was, it's been our legacy that, that this, this, this whole space is, you know what? How, how do most people play? They play online. They we we all we all we've done um, is is help organize events to to enable them to play, to prove their skills, to get involved, to to uh, ladder up um, for for events and for uh, their their participation, and also the the the, the fact that these these players that not only are they learning how to how to be better players, but they're also how learning how to be personas and. To be the be, to be the next uh, uh, Tifu or to be the, the next Doctor Disrespect. That's that's what we're trying to help um, our players, both on the collegiate side and on the world gaming side. So so I I, I don't think uh, it's safe to say it wasn't a thoughtful thing that we did 
from our, to, to protect ourselves. It was just our it was just our legacy and the, and the means by which we we got this whole thing started. Mm, how yeah. about you, Ben? Yeah, for us, the only thing we were able to do that, you know, this is not something we could have planned uh, to help us is that we've built a loyal community and fan base. And, you know, when, you know, shit hits, shit hits the fan like this, uh, we have so many great people that are part of all of our communities that want to keep playing with us and are active in our Discord. And more than ever, we really see what we're doing in terms of building a community. And it also works with our employees. Like we, we've had to make tough choices and cuts, and 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 almost all of them have stood by us and said, "Yeah, we're going to work with you guys until we we can get through this." So, um, I think companies that are able to have that fan base, and um, so even if you're in a vertical that's going to be really hard hit, like, like the one we're in, um, if you've if you've built that loyalty and following, then they'll stay with you and and help you get through it. Yeah, yeah. We, bring, yeah. we bring up a good point. We could, you know, we could have all the online tool sets in the world, um, but the, the, the work that's required to build a community, which is where the value is in this, in this business for, for us um, and for when we, we're all beholden to the supreme gods in this business, they're the publishers, and the value that we bring is, and, and you guys too, is, is building communities and giving players the reason to show up, giving the players the reason to come back. And um, that's that's not easy. Everyone's oh, you you put up a tournament, you'll you'll get people dropping at your, at your doorstep, and that's and that's not how it works. So so you bring up a really good right. point. The, the value of, of community building, especially in some in a time like this, is um, is invaluable. There's just there's just no way to put a price tag on how important it is to be able to 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 build a, a community around a particular game or or, or a particular uh, set of activations. And some of the themes I'm seeing from both of you guys, as well as uh, sales and in the wider market, is two things that's been common in esports, which is number one, diversification of revenue streams. I'm, you know, almost sick of doing podcasts with esports teams about that exact topic, about how they can get away from a purely only sponsorship model. And if anyone's listening, you know, I did a podcast with FaZe Clan's chief revenue officer. They do a great job. Did a podcast with Patrick Mahoney from Nations, which is a a merchandising business, talking about that specific topic for 20, 30 minutes as well. Another fantastic listen to, or any of the other podcasts and big esports podcasts talked about that. And the other one is keeping cash low and not having to raise to stay alive. I think that's something. And that, that really brings us into the next topic that we talked about a little bit before we started, um, which wasn't a topic that we posted publicly, but... I've talked about this in a in a few uh, podcasts since, as well as Patrick said this um, to me on a on a phone call from Wear Nations. Is that you know it's his belief that now is the time to think about merging. That if you're fighting tooth and nail against another competitor, another company in the market, maybe now is the time to pick up the phone and say, hey, can we settle our differences and let's have a chat about you know how we can do a bit of work together. I know you had a had a few thoughts on that, Wim. All, all I I said and and it's it's a really good uh, topic and. Um, and subject to, to to talk about um, this this is a good time certainly for those kinds of uh, collaborations and and partnership conversations strategic partnership conversations to happen but but the last year this industry has been heading for consolidation anyway and maybe maybe even longer but um, um, this is the, just just given this cataclysmic uh, uh, environment we're all in now and and companies you know looking to to not only to to uh, to build, but to just to survive. This is a really important time. The, the industry is going to consolidate one way or the other. It's already it's already happening, as I said. So now would be a really good time. And in in the right circumstances, you might get a really good value at the same time. So um, so I think that's a that's a, that's a great point, and it's a and it's a very very important time for for companies to be thinking um, exactly along those lines. Yeah. How about you, Ben? Any thoughts? Yeah, a couple of days after you know the NBA canceled the season and everything followed, I remember sitting in the office. I still work in my office alone, very alone, because it's fourteen thousand square feet for just me. And I'm a very competitive person. And when I think about my competitors, I think about how I want to crush them. And that's the competitive spirit in me. And mm. but given everything that's going on, I picked up the phone and I called my three closest competitors and I said, "Look." If we're ever going to do this, th it's now. It's like now or never. Uh, if we can agree and if we can, uh, if we can create uh, more synergies, a better gaming experience, if, if it makes more sense, the story, to have our companies merge together, 
then let's do it. And, and that's what really has been my philosophy from the onset. Um, I really think the companies that are just in one vertical, and you mentioned especially the team vertical, it's very, very dangerous. And so there's going to be a ton of M&A, especially as capital dries up, both on the public and private markets. It's sink or swim. So um, everyone is going to have a better chance. Uh, we're, all com- we're all competitors for capital. Okay, all esports companies, and everyone's gonna have a better opportunity um, as a bigger, stronger, more diversified company. Mm. And we we haven't we haven't really seen many of these high profile closures or mergers yet, have we? Besides that, I, I believe Team Reciprocity, who, who's also in Canada. Yeah, that was. Yeah, I mean, they collapsed. You know, for for lack of a better term, I mean, I, I you know, I think they're just running kind of a bare bones roster in maybe just crossfire yeah it's a good example i mean that was probably going to be the biggest ipo in canada it was a big deal everyone on bay street was excited about it and just didn't work out and you know i feel for the team there it sucks for the for the management team and all the players um but at the same time it's really a wake-up call to everyone else that uh i think the era of dumb money is over the era of this largesse of spend 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 figure it out later is over and and Esports companies have to be profitable, and if you're not willing to do that, then there's going to be a reckoning. Mm, that's, a yeah, reckoning it's gonna... happening, certainly, and it's happening around the periphery, and in, in some cases, in the sort of the, the center of, of esports as well. But it, but as with anything, once once it happens, it will be a healthier realm. It will be a, um, an opportunity to to invest in in solid. You know the uh, the, the whole notion of. Uh, of uh, uh, of survival is is uh, is a bit is a big part of esports right now and and if you're not a pro team even the pro you know even some of the pro teams are are they're capital rich but uh, they they still are proving that it's tough to make money so um, so it, it is a it's a it's a crucial time you're, it's a great topic and a crucial time for for all, all entities in this space to, to 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 hunker down and and get serious about this as a business. Yeah, there's only really one sort of uh, merger or acquisition example I can think of, which is in Australia. There was a team called Tainted Mines that uh, attracted some investment and turned into Icon, and that was their um, Phoenix that they ended up turning them into a holding company and acquiring another team called Chiefs. And these guys have a serious board behind them, Um, you know, head of head of capital markets at Commonwealth Bank, which I believe is the number one bank in Australia. They've got Adrian Whittingham on their board, who's the MD of Pinnacle Investment Partners, which is a fifty-four billion dollar AUD portfolio and things yeah. like that too. But yeah, I haven't seen that so much in, in other cases, but yeah, it's going to be interesting because we all know how much money these teams are raising. We all know how much money these teams are spending, you know, with, with TSM opening up their, you know, claimed $50 million facility, million. the 100 Thieves yeah. facility, you know, yeah. FaZe just raised $30 million. I would, you know, it would be my opinion that with the money I've seen in the influencer market, FaZe and 100 Thieves are going to be doing very swimmingly right now. You know, a lot of my friends in the influencer space are signing you know, two, three, four, five hundred percent more than they were before this pandemic as everything moves online. But yeah, it's going to be interesting to see for me. I guess those more traditional esports teams, like a lot of the ways I like to put on the graph is like if you've got a traditional sports slash esports team, it's maybe like a Cloud9 or a TSM or a Liquid. You've got someone in the middle, which is a hybrid kind of influencer content agency and team, which is 100 Thieves, and then all the way to the left, which is FaZe, which is sometimes I forget they have any esports teams because, you know, they're just doing a lot of great stuff in Fortnite and with streamers and such. You know, I'll I'll just add one more thought here is that, you know, here here we're talking a lot about the intersection of esports and and sports traditional with the with traditional mainstream with the new mainstream. Um, I do think there are going to be a ton of opportunities for traditional companies coming in um, to say, okay, now we get esports, we want to invest, we want to own, we want to. It 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 doesn't it doesn't mean just a team. It could be infrastructure. I do think there's still a lot of investment opportunity in the infrastructure side of, of esports, but now. With these these circles intersecting, um, it's the traditional media companies, traditional sports entities that are going to come in and say, "Okay, we get esports now. We know that our footprint and our our levers can help the esports teams, just like they can help us uh, connect with a with a more youthful audience and a and a really difficult to reach audience." So, so on one hand, uh, we we I, I think the esports realm uh, can be very inbred. Uh, it's esports teams talking to esports organizers, organizers talking to publishers, talking to. But now, now the traditional media—it's the it's the NBCs of the world, it's the Foxes of the world—they're all saying, "Wow, 
there is something here that we got to be that we got to tap into. And, and uh, again, sort sort of this consolidation of 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 esports is certainly happening. But I also think now the awakening is coming for the traditional mainstream, and there will be more capital coming in uh, from companies who can see the levers and the strategic nature of of a of a you know, of an esports entity, no matter what it is, technology, team, uh, platform, uh, infrastructure, whatever it is. So yeah, just to add on the M and A point. It, it's a good point that there haven't been sort of these mega blockbuster deals. Uh, you do have Enthusiast Gaming and Luminosity, which was, was a mega merger last year um, in Canada and North America. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that there is a lot, a lot, a lot of M&A. It's just not really called that. It's called selling off your roster. So when Renegade sells their roster to 100 Thieves in, in Counter-Strike, that's m and I mean, but we don't really, the outside business world maybe doesn't look at it like that or call it like that but the act of buying and selling of rosters is big and there's been some big rosters that have moved and changed hands, especially in not, well, really only in non-franchise leagues. So a lot, a lot in Counter-Strike um, and that's probably gonna keep going, but you're right, I'm very surprised that there hasn't been, you know, sort of another mega blockbuster deal. Yeah, that's an interesting point actually that, that you mentioned. I never, never really thought about it that way before. I've got a friend who runs an esports organization in Australia, and he's made a lot of money over the years by, you know, picking star up and coming players, providing them with, you know, uh, facility and and training to be able to become someone better, and then selling them off. You know, he's got players that are now in Sweden, he's got players that are now in America, that are other teams in Australia and such. And it's been a, you know, we we helped him a little bit with his with his capital raise process and doing some training for him about pitching and all that kind of stuff. And that was a it was a significant revenue line for him. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Only so imagine. What what else are you guys seeing in 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 response from your friends or, or competitors or anything like that? I know I mentioned a little bit about you know influencer marketing going up. I see um, someone in the who joined in the chat as well, Kieran, um, who runs an influencer marketing agency that's that's selling more than ever right now. I know that for us, some of our clients who we were planning live events with have moved into influencer marketing. Um, and there's been a lot of, um, you know, a lot of talk around that area and a lot of growth in viewership. But is there any, is there anything that you guys are seeing in the market that people are doing for great success besides, you know, contacting these large media organizations besides talking about M and A's? You know, the, the one thing that we're seeing, I'm sure and you're, you're all inundated with it right now is in this time, um, the, the, the intersection of traditional sports athletes, the other night, there was a, uh, actually, it was a really good event. Um, I was going to make another point, but but the Warzone event uh, that was Ezekiel Elliott and Trevor May and and uh, what was what was cool about it, you know, is that these guys can play. Trevor May ended up winning. You know, he's a great Fortnite player. He's one of one of Tyler's uh, best friends. Um, uh, he um, he they, their their team won, and 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 that but that. Was, that was a rare exception where these these traditional pro athletes can actually play in a, a game, you know, a, a video game and an esports uh, competition fairly well. There's been so many uh, events where you know the all the Premier League players get on online to play uh, play FIFA and and the, ultimately they're not very good. And so <laughs> the, the the interest in watching watching that it wanes quickly. You know you. You see, you see these guys. They, you know, they, they, they're obviously far better on the field than they are on the on the on the joystick. And and um, so so I think I think some of that there's there's a lot of learnings there that the celebrity names will will, will draw people in, but they but if the play isn't good, they won't keep them around. So um, it's no you know it's no different than the mm -hmm. sports. You know, you're you're going to watch a, a a bunch of ten year olds play baseball, or do you want to watch the Washington Nationals? Win the World Series, and and I, I I'm not disparaging ten year old baseball. You got to start somewhere. That's not it was not my my intent at all. But but yeah. you know what? I, I hopefully you know what I'm getting at. That yeah that yeah. It's I've been over this. I've the, been over this before with play. discussions. Yeah, I've been yeah. over this before with discussions with like uh, Golf Australia, uh, who we talked to for quite some time, was about, you know, what game do we pick for some of their golfers to play against members of the public then? You know, we had, and once again, you know, cricket being a massive game in Australia, we've got an Aussie spin bowler called Shane Warne, who also lives in Melbourne. And I've done some work with his son, quite a lot of work with his son before. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, he's the second highest wicket taker of all time. And we had him on Fortnite for a while, twice. But, 
you know, after 10, 15 minutes, it starts to get a bit old because he can't yeah. move and aim at the same time. He doesn't know how to build. And, <laughs> you know, it went okay when his son did, like, the movement and he did the aiming or vice versa, and we got him one kill. It got featured on some meme pages and it hit, you know, <laughs> three, four, 500 concurrent viewers where his son was normally getting 20 or 30. So, obviously, some good growth. Yeah. But still, it's the fact of, yeah, how long can you go and, and what game do they play? Um, and, you know, maybe that's where games like Rocket League are great because they're just point and drive kind of thing. You know, anyone with a basic need for speed background, which pretty much everyone has, can can play that sort of game. So I think for content creators, uh, and, you know, in general, uh, there's nothing wrong with having, taking people out of their place and putting them in a game. Like, I think it's funny to watch people who have never played Fortnite play Fortnite and, you know, have them rage and figure out what's going on. So I feel like that's a, a good format for entertainment. I would like to watch... You know, any celebrity, you know, who's never played, uh, never played the game, especially older ones, uh, it's exciting to watch. How do people interact? It's like, how do you speak a new language that you've never seen or heard before? Mm -hmm. um, but just in general, the trend is I really like that the amount of charity streams that are happening. Um, you know, the one with uh, Twitch and EGLX uh, raised 2.7 million. Um, the Warzone one, with the, the Celebrity Warzone uh, and and those are the big ones, but you know what? What really isn't making the news is there's probably hundreds and hundreds of small micro influencers yeah. and companies that are raising 500 bucks, a thousand bucks, and are just saying, "Hey, we're going to use the tools that we have. It's gaming, and we're going to do a stream, and we'll raise money and do what we can." And I love seeing that across the board. Um, so while the big multi-million dollar streams are important because they raise the big dollars and they're frankly the most entertaining to watch. Uh, we really have to appreciate the everyday person and content creator, company, business that's, you know, saying, look, I'm just going to get on. I'm going to do what I do for do what I can do for the cause. Yeah, the the charity the charity angle is an interesting one, and obviously we've seen so much of that intersection. TikTok did a forty eight hour concert, which granted wasn't gaming, but was you know artists performing from all over the world, and and you know I remember at the end it was uh, I, I caught a lot of the Brazilians performing, everything from rappers to DJs to you know kind of classical type artists, and you know we've we've seen um, a lot of these large tournaments and these war zone tournaments, these pro ams and such. Is there anything that you guys haven't seen done thus far that that someone might want to jump on? Um, okay, let, let, let's let that brew throughout the rest of this conversation. I'm going to think about it. I'm going to brainstorm some ideas. Let's end with that, with that question. Right. That sounds good. Another, another thing I wanted to, and I know I touched on this briefly once or twice is from, from my experience, talk about the influencer side of the market right now and, and where, you know, where a lot of those numbers are going. So we work with a YouTuber in Australia called Fusion Droid, 21 year old, lives in Brisbane. Um, and yep. creates Minecraft content, has about 1.6 million subscribers. And we've been doing some some brand deals with him recently with NVIDIA and up, and uh, another one upcoming with NVIDIA and another ad in board partner as well. His, his watch time is up 1.3 million hours over the past month. Um, his his uh, average viewers, his average views per viewer per month is 5.2. <laughs> And he's and he's up 69,000 subscribers in the last month, which is a extra 56% growth compared to you know what what he would normally get so there's so much more of this action happening online also if you look at the <clears throat> viewership in the media market um riad from the the ceo from the gamers group posted on on um my business facebook page about this as well you know during the start of this pandemic they were seeing you know up to a 300 percent growth in in uh what do you call it, readership, but, you know, a 25 to 45% drop, um, 25 at the time and perceived up to 40, 45% drop in ad revenue. And it's really interesting time where everybody's doubling down. I think, um, you know, you guys are on LinkedIn as, as much as I am. You'll notice that LinkedIn is smashed right now with content. There are so many more um, athletes that are streaming now as well. You know, jiu-jitsu athletes who I didn't even know played games, you know, like Kit Dale, um, an Aussie who lives in LA, he's streaming right now. Um, my girlfriend follows a lot of um, makeup artists and such on Instagram, and she can't even get to her stories because she has to scroll through all the lives that happen at once. And I see this on my TikTok now as well. I follow probably 20 people on TikTok to stay up to date with that. And then the same thing too, nonstop live, especially this one guy in Australia who's been live for, I feel like, nine hours a day all of the time. So are we are we hitting that point where there's market saturation or are we hitting that point where there's just so many more people at home uh, that are going to be watching this content? And do you guys have any access into that that influencer market? Is there anything that you guys are seeing in there? We we, we are, you know, two years ago, pivoted away from any any sort of paid media. Um, 
and purely, well, almost almost purely, uh, relying on influencer support for marketing our events and makes okay. all in the world. We we you know put up a Call of Duty event, we put up a Rocket League event. You you know you you go to the Call of Duty influencers, you go to the casters that people are following that that are that are affiliated with and known for uh, Call of Duty. That's the right way. It's the most surgical way to to reach. Um, an audience for for us the influencer thing is pre, is pretty um, we we I think we got it down I, I the prices are going up there's no question because uh, um, uh, they 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 influencers smart our influencers are smart they recognize that they bring value for someone like us for for uh, engaging the, the base of fans and base of viewers that that we want to attract for for either participation in our events or for viewership of our events so so. Um, uh, it's a it's a it's a wonderful I think it's a wonderful thing and and uh, um, there I do think that at some point there will be be saturation I I predicted uh, uh, and projected saturation a year ago it's it, it obviously it hasn't happened um, where whereby um, an influencer's ability to influence that's that I'm not re I'm not referring to saturation from an amount I'm, I'm referring to a a, a, sa a saturation from an influencer's uh, point of view that. How much? How much more influential can they be um, than they than they they have been already? And you know, will will audiences continue to follow them? Will they feel like they're being pandered to? That will they be, be they, will they feel like they're being sold? Um, those are the things I think we 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 have to be careful of. But but uh, you know, frankly, we haven't seen we haven't seen the uh, the effects of that yet. And and uh, our our influencers still are our number one means by which to reach our audiences. We have, we have many audiences given you don't market to a call of duty player. Like you, you market to a smash player, like you market to a, to a rocket league player. So, so uh, influencers are a really important part of our, certainly of our, of our mix. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with that. I don't think there's, there's saturation there. Um, and the price is going up. And I think we have to look at the distribution platforms to give us insight in that. And you would have thought maybe if it was just a Twitch game, that yeah, maybe they would stack the cards against some of the smaller content creators and really just focus on the, the big 10 or 20 that oper that take down a good chunk of their market share. Um, but with, man, maybe Mixer, but at the very least, for sure, YouTube and Facebook gaming come in. Um, I think that's going to raise the value for people to come in and it's going to open the door for more content creators to be able to make a living doing it um, because they're going to get sort of a better deal from now that there's four or five legitimate streaming platforms in in north america so i think this is the the golden age um maybe not for you know for youtube a little bit like for non-gamers it is hard to you know to get a million subs in, in today's day and age um but i think for streaming um you've got a great chance and it's just going to keep going yeah, there's some interesting comments, um, especially from you, Wim, because I have a I have a client who's um, all very much the same opinion, and they want to use us to to make that transition. You know, they're doing uh, over a hundred grand a month in Facebook ads, and you know, they're saying to me, "Is how can we move that to people instead yeah. of Facebook?" Because you know, yeah. it's a and they didn't say this, but it's my opinion that um, you know, Facebook doesn't care about you if you spend ten dollars a month, if you spend three million dollars a month, they don't really give a shit about who's spending that. But a person might, and a lot of the influencers we work with at them have done extra delivery for free because they've enjoyed the product, they've enjoyed the relationship, and they've also enjoyed you know the commission that comes with that, and they understand about building that relationship ongoing. Whereas someone like Facebook, you know, they're never going to give you anything for free. And obviously, if you look at the engagement rates and the exposure rates, you know, I don't even use it anymore, but. <clears throat> I remember I had a, I made Thermal Takes Australia, Thermal Take Australia's Facebook page, you know, when I started there in 2011. And with 1,200 likes, I was organically reaching as many people three years later with 12,000 likes. Um, so, you know, it, it makes sense, I think, to me to move to influencers. What was the, what was the push for you and, and your companies to move over purely to influencers away from paid media? Was it the cost? Was it the actual influence? Was it a, was it a mixture? It was, it was the efficiency and the effectiveness of what we were seeing that it was, and and certainly the cost that um, uh, we could we could for a you know a, a quarter of the price we could we could be far more effective in our reach and our target um, by by virtue of, of bringing a bringing an influencer into you know, again our our marketing is largely around marketing our events um, and in two stages both for early early on to to uh, garner registrations for our events and then on the second stage in the second half to to garner viewership and uh, uh, Influencers, you know, you follow a, 
a Call of Duty influencer because you like Call of Duty, you, that's that's exactly the 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 target that we're looking for. So it was it's it was largely efficiency, effectiveness, and and uh, a, a, a very uh, economical uh, spend as well. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And it's funny, it's going full circle. We're working with a media organization that's looking to pay influencers to expose what they're doing. <laughs> so I think I think they agree with you, which is pretty funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No. yeah. So what, what does the plan look like for you guys when all of this is over? Let's say that we're, you know, finishing up in, in three to six months and, and people are starting to get back to work. You know, maybe the economy is starting to kick back up and people are going back outside. They're no longer on self-isolation or lockdown. You know, do you guys have have a sort of plan in place, and what's the rough structure of that? So I'm a little bit more bare, uh, bullish on uh, opening projections. Um, even just today, like in Canada, um, in, in one of the provinces, you know, they're going to be reopening in early early to mid May. So you know, and which province is that? Saskatchewan. Oh, how about that? So, yeah. So there are uh, uh, beauty uh, beauty parlors, golf courses. There's a whole list that are that are going to get sort of eased into opening up. So the fact that part of this country is going to be open for business in May gives me a little bit more certainty on on figuring out when that timeline is because you know we have book events and all the planning. So we're probably looking at some time in June uh, as the best case scenario. Maybe worst case scenario would be July. Uh, so it's not that far out. Um, but you know what? You have you know basically almost six months worth of events that have been postponed that now are really all going to be squeezed into Q3 and Q4 of 2020. Wow. So like in, in a way, we may not even lose revenue. The fact that all these tournaments that are just really going to be postponed and pushed now to Q3 and 4, um, we're pretty optimistic we can recoup all of those, uh, a good chance of those tournaments that were postponed. And also I think for gamers, you know, not to generalize too much, but, you know, our our, our audience is, you know, 16 to, you know, 24. Um, and I don't really think they're going to be as hesitant to come back and game as, you know, maybe older people or other segments of the population. So if we said we're open today, for sure, we're going to, a lot of people come in masks and we're going to have proper procedures and we're going to sanitize every freaking keyboard and mouse and headset um, on the face of the earth to make sure we don't have that problem here. Um, but we have that real demographic that's going to come and keep going. And that's why, like, when we talked about the golden age for esports, because that's all everyone's watching now, man, it's going to be good Q3 and 4 when you have, like, all the top events, both on the amateur level, pro level, squeezed into six months of the year. Like, what else can we ask for? Great, great point. Great point. Mm. You know, yeah, for, what, about, what about you, Wim? Well, for, for us, I think that, you know, this – what we're seeing now, this this notion of the, you know, I've used the, the phrase, the reference a couple times, is the, the traditional mainstream and the new mainstream coming together and intersecting now in a much more overt way. Um, that's going to have that's going to have real positive effects on on our business from you know a, an awareness perspective, from elevating our events into into bigger uh, uh, events, more. Um, more aware, more awareness, more viewership, uh, more participation. That's a great thing for uh, for us because that means we can now um, attract more sponsors and and uh, the the monetization around all of that is a is a really good thing. I I um, and I and I think it, it's and again I'll I'll say this as I said it before. Um, that's not just us. It's it's going to be other entities that that feel this same sort of. Um, uh, benefit this this uh, halo effect uh, of of what what has happened and how this now now the digital chasm if there were if there were generational chasms between uh, from a from a digital perspective think of a you know fifty year old versus a twenty five year old those chasms are now evaporating they're they're being eliminated and and if you you know you uh, think about Zoom uh, you know I, I I talked about I used to get on an airplane just to go have a meeting I. I I, now I'm used to, I, of course, I've always been uh, in the digital realm, but now I'm used to using Zoom. I'm probably not going to get back on an airplane to go to go have a, an hour meeting. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think I think things like that um, on the esports side are are, are elevating uh, the, the the presence and the and the importance and the value of of, of our programming and and all the all the programming in the esports space. So this this notion of the mm -hmm. the the this very important cultural moment. 
about the intersection of, of traditional and, and non-traditional or, or new new mainstream is going to propel this business in a in a very different way. And and I do think um, if this might if, if if we nothing else had happened, we probably could have gotten there in a five to seven year time frame. I think now it's here, and um, and to the, at, at the expense of um, a, you know horrific global pandemic, uh, it's it's going to benefit uh, what we do. Um, what this intersection looks like, not just for us, it's going to bring, it's going to bring millennials and Gen Z's this very difficult to reach audience into the traditional mainstream. They're going to, they may not be watching baseball now, but they're, they're, they're likely to, to be exposed to it now. And, and, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, a game changing, no pun intended game changing, uh, moment for, for all of us. What do you, what do you think about, and there's been quite a few questions about this from from various people, what do you guys think about? I guess life after this for esports. Do you think it's going to stay around in the exact capacity that we're seeing with the traditional markets? Do you think we're going to see um, accelerated growth? You know, as we've seen over the past month or two. Like, what's the trend going to look like? I'm, I'm, you know, bullish, I'm bullish on the on the on the 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 lift. It's it's going to the lift is here and it's going to stay here and it's going to it's after after everyone's back to their to their regular lives after more live events come back. Um, I, I, I think it, it, the, the sort of the, the growth and the, this meteoric, um, uh, uh, view people have have now of esports. I think, I think that's going to, it's going to, um, uh, wane just a bit, but I, but I also think that, as I said earlier, the genie's out of the bottle. It's, it's a, now it's a, it's a dynamic dynamic that, that everybody is, is getting to and understanding and, I, I'm I'm very bullish on this. is going to be a, um, a a big moment for for esports and and continue to to accelerate it going forward. Hmm. So so maybe you guys can relate to this, but you know when I tell people sort of what I do and what esports is, the most common sort of statement I get is people say, "I just don't understand how people watch other people play video games." Have you heard? Have you guys heard that before? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So. And it, to me, it's the craziest statement because there's so much trash on television and other things like why do people have a problem with esports? Um, so I think, yeah, to, to the points that we've kind of brought up is that this is really the opportunity where we've changed a lot of minds. But at the same time, I think we need to realize that how much further we need to go. And I say that in the sense that, you know, now that ESPN is showing League of Legends, great. But do you know what that broadcast looks like, like for the non um, League of Legends player? It's just, it's still impossible to follow. So I think now that we've kind of got everyone's attention to say, hey, let's check out esports. I think it's up to uh, the content creators, the broadcast, the talent is to be able to provide a better viewing experience for non-gamers. So that's, if someone's gonna say, hey, you know, I am gonna check out the Rio Major because now I can bet on it in Vegas and Counter-Strike is a relatively easier game to follow. Um, but we all need to make a push to start explaining the rules. Because when you explain the rules of an esport and you understand the strategy, that's when people are going to get it. And we need those new audience numbers to keep fueling this industry, or else, um, you know, we're we're still going to be sitting at that 1.2, 1.3 billion dollar mark, which really means that esports is not that big of an industry, especially compared to the whole video game industry as a whole. Yeah, yeah, makes sense to me. Any any closing comments from you guys before we before we head off at all? Any advice? Um, I, I like, I liked our, our topic about, about the, 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 this is the time to, um, you know, you're in this business. If you're, if you're struggling or you, you see a, a pivot, um, that makes sense for you, now would be the time to, to, uh, to dive into it and to explore it and, uh, and seek, seek, uh, partners, seek the strategic, uh, partners that, who your business can supplement theirs and vice versa. I think those that's a really good advice and, and it's certainly the right time to, to, uh, to, to take it on. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. How about you been? Yeah. Maybe I'll revisit your question on what hasn't been done or what could be done. Yeah. I thought about it is that, yes, we've, we've seen that great transition um, from traditional sports playing esports, but we haven't seen that in politics. Like I'd love to see uh, the prime minister of Canada and the president of the United States, you know, do a show match, uh, you know, uh, a Fortnite duo for charity. Like there's so many sports celebrities that have done it and that's great. But if we can bring in politics, if we can bring in politicians, 
different countries or different parties, whatever it is, to get into gaming with the amount of attention that would bring. Um, it would be so fascinating to watch. I think it could raise so much money for charity. Uh, I've pitched it before to a, a local hospital foundation to do this. Um, but I think that's got to be the next inroad, the next category of no, of moving over sort of non-gamers into the esports world. Ben, you're on to something. I think that's how the next U.S. presidential election should be decided. Biden against Trump in a in a Fortnite duo. Let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> one v one box fighting challenge. Sounds I think great. That, epic, box fight. Yeah. Epic, think of the house party volume that would uh, you vote. You can vote in house party and have the match played off in uh, in uh, in Fortnite. Great idea. Really. If good. they've it's even that, heard of Fortnite, that would be a, a, a miracle in and of itself. I I I, I doubt that. I, and I I'm a U.S. citizen. So. It sounds like there's a. Uh, it sounds like there's a new a new version of chess boxing on the horizon. It's got to be yeah. esports boxing, or Fortnite boxing. Good, good stuff, Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks thanks so much for joining us today, guys. It was really good to to talk about you know I guess some solutions and and what you are seeing in the market and what you're actually doing. Um, if if anyone wants to reach out to connect with you, if anyone wants to reach out to uh, try to M and A with you, where can they do so? For me, I'm mainly on LinkedIn. Um, so just you know Ben Fefferman or uh 5k fef on twitter that's that's me right there um can i get my finger right there that's we me wim stocks i'm the only wim stocks on linkedin i think uh so i'm happy to connect with you there my twitter is at w-i-i-i-m yeah fantastic thanks for joining us today guys thank you guys great thanks a lot chris yeah. great yeah. Thank you. thanks Thanks to everyone who's watching, whether live now on LinkedIn, Twitch, watching the VOD back later or listening uh, on to the audio only version of the podcast. We've got plenty more of these coming out, uh, including chatting with um, some people from FaZe Clan next week about exactly this very similar topic and, you know, how they managed to raise $30 million through a pandemic with a la absolute laundry list of, of rappers, um, NBA players. There's a uh, Dutch football are thrown in there and many others as well. So hopefully this content can help you throughout the time, whether you're bored at home, uh, unfortunately looking for a job or looking to survive or thrive. Thanks for listening, guys. We'll see you again soon.